will say this uh, this lecture today will be taken care of by Björn Frostell. Björn is a member of the Ralsi Society here in Sweden, of course. He is also, uh, he was one of the persons um, taking part in the Uswater project, uh, coordinating the Royal um, uh, University of Technology in Stockholm. He is a professor now emeritus at the uh, University of Technology in Stockholm in uh, industrial ecology. So he has been working with these issues for very many years. He has much of uh, foreign experience, especially in South America, Latin America, but has been working on many places. Um, so he's a big enthusiast for uh, Uzbekistan, you know, <laughs> and Central Asia history. Um, uh, I think we should simply ask him to uh, deliver his lecture. And so you, the, you are welcome, Jörn. It's the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, very much. I will make sure that uh, you all can hear me. Is that so? Yes, we're here. Very good. And then I will try then to connect to my uh, lecture pictures. So there, can you all see the presentation now? Yes. How is it? Um, it is okay. Yes, everything is clear. Uh, then welcome to this lecture on uh, water use and management uh, dash uh, cleaner production. Uh, uh, is that I will first start a few uh, general comments on uh, ecology and on thinking around ecology ecology and economy and uh, resource uh, management. I think this is very important now in these days because uh, during my lifetime, so I think the attitude towards learning has changed, at least in my country and my surroundings. Before it was so that I felt when I was a student that I needed to learn a lot of facts first about history, about uh, society and about technology. And later at the university, I needed to learn a number of formulas, a number of calculation algorithm and so on. I don't think this is so important anymore at the moment because you can always find this very easily at the internet and otherwise. What you, we need now is to think. And here I would say to think freely about what we observe, what we can uh, what is it, uh, see with our logic and what we can do uh, from this. And that more and more we need to amplify our systems that we think around. Uh, my son, when he was 15 years old, he came home after being drunk for the first time. And I was quarreling with him for 30 minutes. And then he said, dad, don't you understand that in my age, it's only beer and girls that count. <laughs> and to me, this shows a bit that we only think around ourselves to start with. And then with age and so on, we can think wider and wider. And now we need to think both of ourselves, our families, our work, our country, and also about the world. Everything needs to be included in this thinking because we live in a globalized economy and a globalized world. And that is also part of why I can see the problems and the challenges in Uzbekistan also as my challenges, because they are so serious that we will all need to understand what is behind and how we can handle them. So the first part about water use and management and the general things around what we are doing have been doing. So this picture, it will illustrate a little bit about concepts I think uh, are important to know about. 
Uh, and here we can say that waste, waste management, water, water management and air pollution, they started really with the industrial revolution around 1750 in England in the Western Europe. And then when we got waste, so simply we had waste dumping. And still the major part of waste of all types of kind, they are simply dumped into the environment. And this is perhaps uh, the real greatest challenge that this is the case. As late as in uh, 1960s, triggered among others by Rockel Carson's book, Silent Spring, where we started to understand that there are systems aspects, ecological systems aspects. So waste minimization started to uh, take place and people start to discuss it. And then we had, uh, uh, let me see, we, ex external treatment. That was the end of pipe solutions that came in 1960s. And this waste minimization and recycling as a more proactive approach, it started around 1980. And then the book uh, sustainable, around sustainable development, the report from the so-called Brundtland Commission, that has changed and broadened the scope of how to handle uh, then, uh, different types of ecological challenges. And sub-concepts within sustainable development that are specifically uh, important for today's lecture, that's uh, industrial ecology, which is uh, the way of looking at society in an ecological way with metabolic uh, processes and uh, societal metabolism as important. We had cleaner production coming around 1990, later broadened this concept now clean tech that is not so much used as uh, I thought it would be because it's an extension of the cleaner production. And now the new buzzword, at least in the uh, Western countries, that circular economy, where we can say that in a semantic way, so the physical resource management is connected to the economic economy of society that now is ruling what is going on. Uh, a little bit very general what we need to know. So now we can stay in society. So we have big raw material inputs. We have a small degree of circulation and we have a, a, a great part, a large part of final waste. So high raw material use and low degree of recycling. And this will have to change in the future to something where we can decrease the raw material input, so we have low raw material input and we have a high degree of recirculation. So this is the basic concept that is around, uh, you could say, cleaner production, also about water use and water management. Life cycle perspective. Uh, for very long, so we have simply talked about the so-called uh, core system, where we have influent flows, we have some type of production or service, and we have outflows, we have emissions, and we have waste. But now more and more, we need to have a much broader approach, where we see both uh, that we have an upstream system that can be raw material acquisition before, uh, production and that is waste, uh, what is in management as a downstream system. And very often we can see chains, production consumption chains that are seven, eight steps long. And then we need to consider all the inflows and all the outflows from uh, this whole system. And here we can define also to say that the clean tech system boundary, that is the broad life cycle thinking approach. While clean air production that we'll talk about, that is for the core system, a specific production process, and also some part to, relating to the rest, but focus in on the so-called core system in a life cycle perspective. We can see, for example, in Sweden, we have had uh, more or less, uh, what do you say, the same uh, type of uh, emissions during the last few years, 20 years or so, despite a uh, gross domestic product increase of about 40%. But this is because we have exported our emissions from the consumption to, for example, mostly East uh, Asia. 
And we uh, now increasingly agree that we need to include also emissions in other parts of the world that are dependent on our own consumption. Uh, sorry to say, so this is not uh, reflected in international statistics today. And that means that the figures, there are very many figures, but they are not really adequate to reflect what is actually going on. So consumption has been in the last, uh, could I say, decades, the most driving force for global uh, emissions. Uh, a paradigm shift that is on that I like to figure and that I have um, uh, adopted here. That is that the first part is to have the so-called end of pipe uh, approach. And that is to install waste uh, treatment or wastewater treatment or air treatment. So you fight the symptoms, what is coming out. And then the second level here, that is to uh, improve some part of the production or service chain. And then you uh, improve a whole system. And then at the end, as I started here, the global system optimization this is how we can gradually expand our systems uh, thinking and amplify the thoughts and see how different things are connected simply since we are connected through uh, all economic affairs and trade. We can take this as a little example now today uh, on our, this lecture and this course. That the first step in this here, that is, for example, that we have a catalyst for exhaust gases in a turbine on an airplane. The second step is that we have a, to make the planes much more fuel efficient. A, an ordinary airline today is about 40% more efficient than only three, four decades ago. But this has been eaten up by far by the increased number of flights uh, in the earth. So it doesn't help anyhow. And then in the next, which is now on um, in, in the, what do you say, pipeline in um, Sweden and otherwise, can we create electric aviation, especially on the shorter flights? And then now when we're sitting here on Zoom, do we really need to travel? Can we achieve the same result without travel? So this is how to uh, only exemplify how we need to change our way of thinking. And that, that is actually more important than to know the calculation algorithm and uh, facts. We can, we can reach them in a few seconds on the internet. Now to the water, and this is connected to both uh, and to Lars previous lectures just to show you here that uh, in around 1900 so there was 0 0.5 cubic meters of water used in the world now we have around 4 million uh, or trillion cubic meters per year and these we have the years and then this is an eight times increase in 120 years and then we compare this to uh, before, let's say we go back 100,000 years in human history. How do we really think about, are we going to increase eightfold again in the next 120 years or what? And this is a very general trend and uh, I use this example simply because water is such a central resource and it's also connected to our uh, very strong involvement and uh, enthusiasm for the challenges of the uh, Aral C syndrome. Uh, what is then it in? Four trillion cubic meters of water. How much is it? This is another way. We have a tank, if we can build one, that is 17.2 kilometers in diameters and 17.2 uh, kilometers in height. There we can have the global water use uh, at the moment. In one way, you can say that, oh, it, it, isn't it more if we compare to the seas and to the ice shelves on the earth and so on? But it is a tremendous amount of water. Well, in Uzbekistan, I've tried to find some recent figures, and there are figures up to 2014, 2017 in different databases. What is clear here, when we look from 1995 to 2005, it's interesting to see that the water use per capita 
it has decreased from around 2,400 cubic meters per capita down to a little bit above uh, 2,000. So I will come back to this to compare also that this is a very high number. So one can say in one way that is interesting, we have seen the Aral Sea disappeared, but there is really in comparison to other countries, no lack of water in Uzbekistan. It is the way the water is used that is the real uh, problem. Here we can see um, then this picture and I will not use this. This picture I really uh, encourage you to uh, go through and uh, look at it so that you can analyze it a little bit more in detail. Um, I will mention a couple of things. We can see here from, is from Uzbekistan, is from USA and it's Sweden, 2002 and 2017. And here we can see that uh, if we compare the total uh, what withdrawal of water, that's how much is put into the societal system. And that means that it's not the water actually that is used because in all uh, what is the activities, we lose uh, resources from uh, what is say supply to use. And for example, in Swedish municipal systems, it is well recognized that approximately 25% uh, leakage of the water. So one fourth is going away. The uh, absolute withdrawal here, we can see that uh, compare how it is in, for example, Uzbekistan and in um, United States. That it's similar if we see per, uh, uh, in, in comparison to per capita, that I think is very interesting. If we connect to the previous figure where I said around 2,400 in 1995, and here it was 2,348. We have almost the same in the United States, but in Sweden that actually has more, more water resources per capita than both United States and Uzbekistan, the use of water is far, far lower. So we can say here that from this simple figure that if we compare, for example, the gross domestic product per capita with the water use per capita, so it, there is no need why there should be, uh, what I say, a, a, a difficulty to establish a high gross domestic product, but with low water consumption. Here we can see the very dramatic difference. It, for municipal and industrial water, the differences are not uh, that big. It is actually the agricultural use of water and where Uzbekistan is very, very high on that. If we would compare the water use in Uzbekistan between the three different main sectors. So more than 90% of all water in Uzbekistan that is withdrawn, it is used in agriculture. While it is much less in, in the United States, still the, uh, that United States is in the southern and southwestern part, is very dry uh, country. It is much lower than in Uzbekistan and it is by far very much lower than in Sweden. We have in comparison to United States and Uzbekistan, we have very little water use uh, in agriculture. That doesn't mean that the plants doesn't use water, but we don't have to supply it by human uh, activities. So I encourage you to go through this and also in here think about it because in the break here I want you to draw some conclusions and think about it. Why does it look the way it does in Uzbekistan, in the United States and in Sweden? Then examples of water saving uh, measures. Uh, and here one can say that one of the first things with everything uh, we need to change or we want to change, we want to develop, that is start to understand what is going on. How does the different water balances look like? Where does the water come from? How do we use it and where is it going? So this is a, a very, very central thing, observe. And this thing is very interesting. It goes back uh, again to, I, I would argue, to old observation, both in Central Asia and especially in 
the Greek and Mesopotamia society, where the Greek philosophers, they, uh, Aristotle, for example, and Epicurus, they very strongly said that human actions need to be based on observation and uh, analysis and understanding what is exactly going around uh, ourselves. And this, in one way, it actually stands in conflict with uh, religion, because religion says other things that you need to do this, you need to do that. And I think a very important thing that we all need to think about is that how can we make that we freely can, can observe what is going on and use that as a basis for how we act. Because it is the acts that we do that is what actually is necessary. And then one can have all kinds of different opinions on, on things and how they should be done. The important thing is what is actually being done. Uh, a second important means is to install valves to close water when not used. And here I must say that, that I am very uh, surprised. I was that from coming to Tashkent and also Samarkand and Bukhara and where we discussed this thing about uh, the uh, disappearance of the Aral Sea. And I'm not saying this to blame, but I'm just saying this as an observation that in my whole career where I have been to 60 different countries in the world, so seeing everything from the richest to the poorest parts, nowhere I have seen so much wasted of water as in Tashkent. Uh, I cannot really understand and why, but I think that everyone that is involved in water use and water management need to reflect about this. Because I will come back to that in the other part of the lecture, that the easiest way to really take care of a resource, that is actually to do things that do not need very big investments. It's simply to take care of things in a more efficient way than uh, before. And this goes to the three, fix low hanging fruits, leaks and other things, very poor uh, things that you can more or less just by changing your habits. So you can uh, save resources, save water. Reuse of wastewater, down cl uh, classing of uh, water. And here it is, for example, very interesting that uh, as soon as we see that we can, can uh, collect different types of waters, both, for example, cooling waters, very diluted wastewaters and very concentrated wastewater waste. So normally when we had this end of pipe solution, we felt it was easier simply to bring them all together into a whole river and then go down and install a big uh, wastewater treatment plant. More and more now we are discussing on how can we then separate uh, the different waste streams. Perhaps uh, not creating them, of course, but, but in the second phase, separating them. So now, for example, in Sweden, one of the most challenging, but also on the table, that is how can we uh, separate so-called black uh, water and uh, gray water from uh, households where the black water contains 70 to 80% of the important nutrients of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and we can treat that separately and uh, recycle uh, these nutrients to farmland or different types of cultivation. And how could we uh, then to the gray water and treat it and then use it as second water, for example, flushing toilets, to perhaps even showering and washing, but not as drinking water. And here it is very interesting to see, I have been into this discussion for about 30 years in Sweden. And the very interesting thing is that the biggest, what do you say, stop, the biggest barrier to reach these types of new systems, that is the in water industry itself. Because it's like, you don't want to cut the branch you're, you're sitting on. And this is, uh, one could say, some kind of social resilience in one way, because everyone who wants to change 
of course, in many ways is blue-eyed and has not seen all the challenges with the new system. And when we have big systems, there are also uh, always great difficulties in solving all the small by uh, or mistakes at the beginning. But the the resistance from the Swedish water system to ideas of, for example, a more differentiated uh, treatment of uh, municipal wastewater has really been surprising uh, to me. Uh, number five here to recirculate uh, cooling waters after cooling. And so we have closed water cooling systems. Uh, we have them already well established, for example, in big cooling towers for uh, um, we have nuclear power plants, we have all seen them. And then install recirculation of process water after uh, specific purification could be. We talk about so-called technical kidneys, where we can, for example, have physical treatment like different types of membranes, uh, filtration, uh, uh, reverse osmosis, for example, that that is a rather high level technology, but in certain instances for streams, this is very, very feasible. And then of course, the, far, the, the last is redesign uh, processes. For uh, example, you could have then counter current uh, rinsing. I will mention a little bit about that uh, later, how it is. Here we can see uh, an example that brings like a bridge uh, to the next part of the lecture. This is a big uh, Swedish um, paper mill uh, outside Sundsvall. It's a winter picture and it illustrates a little bit about um, the metabolism of water in a big uh, factory. We can see here that it looks like the whole area is different types of smokes. But it is not smoke, it is actually water vapor because this is a winter day with about minus five degrees and so on. And hold this factory, a paper factory, it is full of circulating very warm to hot water. And therefore it is coming out as these uh, water vapor uh, fumes. And uh, another reason why I am mentioning and showing this picture is that uh, perhaps the greatest step forward in large scale cleaner production that will be the second half is uh, the Swedish and you could also say now the international pulp and paper industry. And here we have a, a renewable uh, raw material which is forest wood coming into a factory. And uh, in a general term, one can say that in 1970, so this uh, type of, of uh, plants, they brought in 100% of raw materials. They produced 90% of these 100%, they were uh, paper and pulp, and 10% they were different types of emissions and wastes. And from this in only 30 years, so they, increased efficiency by more or less, you could say, 99%. So we have only 0.1% uh, of the raw material is now discharged as emissions. And this was by a combination of product changes and of also um, about process changes and uh, with external treatment. So we can see a whole chain here. Uh, a very interesting part here was that to start with, so the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, they demanded that they should use certain technologies to improve this. So it was a central, so to say, demand from an authority. But the industry resisted this and they said, we want to do this our way. So you tell us how much we need to reduce and we will decide on how to do it. And then, of course, cost estimates came into because the business has always had very hard competition economically. So they very quickly find out that to change uh, the processes, to use the proactive cleaner production approach, that was the way to go. So now the external treatment just takes uh, about one tenth. So if two orders of magnitudes are being improved. So one order of magnitude uh, was achieved by process changes 
and one order the second uh, last. Only 10% of the total improvement, it was at the end by external uh, treatment. So I think that this is a very, very good example. And uh, we have a lot of material in Sweden, also in English, if there are interest in that, uh, how they did this in uh, Sweden. And now the last picture from this part of the lecture, it is to put, uh, as I see it, the challenge now, because we can all understand that uh, this picture that is from agriculture in Uzbekistan, I found it on the internet, it demonstrates here this thing that the water is simply disappearing to the greatest extent to the air. So how can, can we jointly find means of reducing uh, the water use? Because the table I showed you before, it shows that there is actually not a lack of water in Uzbekistan. There is a lack of keeping the water within the production systems that uh, uh, are being used and uh, developed. That is the challenge. So with this, uh, I can see we have used half an hour. Um, and then I have two questions for you during the break. I, I think the break, uh, Lars, should be 20 minutes and then we have 10 minutes discussion. Is that right? Yeah, yes, exactly. Mm. Okay. Mm. So the first question is, why is it so important to adopt a life cycle perspective on physical resource metabolism of human activities? I would like you to discuss and think about, so you can say, wh why should we do this? Not only work with a core system, but with a life cycle perspective. The second question is, what main conclusions can be drawn from the water uh, withdrawal numbers presented for Uzbekistan, United States and Sweden? And then I can put this back, I think here. So this, this you have to look at if you um, want and discuss that. Why is this and what could we, uh, what conclusion can we see and, and uh, adopt from this? Okay, let's go on then to the second half and cleaner production. And to start with, I would uh, argue that cleaner production is mainly focused on uh, industrial activities and uh, service activities. So something that uh, you uh, sell on, on, on the market. And uh, it has been a part of, I mean, this general uh, approach for to sustainable development and especially on the um, ecologically sustainable uh, production. And uh, it has been, what you say, forwarded and by a number of different international organizations, perhaps the most important that has been involved, that's the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP. And they have defined this, that it means uh, the continuous application. So it's not something you do at once. It's something where you, you work with a long time to gradually improve. And then to apply, apply an integrated preventive environmental strategy to processes, products and services, and to increase efficiency and reduce the impacts of you to humans and the environment. And here we can also see that the priority is the impact on humans comes first and then the environment comes second. And that I can uh, take in more detail a little bit later. I have been putting another set of this to make also to understand it, that it may be regarded not only as a goal by itself, but rather as a journey towards shaping a more efficient re physical resource metabolism in industrial activities. So how can we do in the most uh, proactive way, change uh, processes and products and services in order to reduce the environmental footprints? for this. We can talk about energy footprint, the water footprint, uh, for example, carbon footprint and phosphorus footprints and so on. 
here it uh, i think it is very important also to see this that we can see now statistics uh, that are very abundant on the number of um, parameters that we have for example climate emissions and for um, water footprints and whatsoever but we have still to be very critical to how this information is uh, produced and what it really shows as i mentioned before so that a country that uh, boy, uh, statistics they are very abundant. There are a number of global databases where you can find good information, part what I have been showing here also, but that they are not, uh, as I would argue, expressed in a way that they, it is very what they useful and that really tells uh, who should do what and so on. Uh, I have in my uh, lectures for almost 20 years I have been creating a, a scale where we need better information, where I have divided the global society into seven different decision levels. And the first and closest to us humans, that is the individual and household level. There we take decisions. We take decisions on the organization and uh, company level. We take the decisions on municipal level in a city or municipality. We take decisions on a provincial or so to in some countries state level and then in others at a national level, at the international regional level where I count for example European Union, United States, China, India and so on. We could say Central Asia and then we take decisions on the global level and we need statistics on all these levels in order to do this. Because here we can clearly see that uh, the most important that we need to have in the global society that is expressed in the 1992 summit in Rio de Janeiro and Agenda 21 for the 21st century, think globally, act locally. And this means in practice that we need this information and actually not even in any country in the world we have these statistics for example at the local administrative level like the municipality. So we worked with this many years ago where we create a so-called combox model that was not a life cycle uh, model but what we could say a cleaner production model for a municipality which made uh, what is a physical resource balances over a municipality. I still see there is a lack of this type of information and for cleaner production also it is very important and here I will elaborate a little bit the principles of how one can work. So the priorities and here we're coming back to this that how should we make priorities because we always have to and then uh, the priority one that we still say it's health aspects for the workers and this means that we still have a what i would say a human orientation on all what we do and at the same time i would also already here say that i think this is one of the greatest obstacles we have to future development that we humans we are so focused on ourselves that now that we have become so strong that we rule the world and we really threaten the world we need to broaden this so that the priorities need to be more focused on the whole than on ourselves the priority two, that is process, accidents, risks. Also, um, we could say are diverted towards mainly humans, but also to economical aspects in the production process. Then priority three, risks for local environmental impact. And then number four, for regional environmental impact. And then number five, risks for global environmental impact. Here we can go back to see when we're talking about both water quantity and water quality in the nucleus, we can see that the risk for the local environmental impact, that is, for example, for the drinking water in nucleus. Risk for regional environmental impact, that is, how do we get the water back to the Aral Sea? We have already had the catastrophe uh, uh, and or the, the risk. 
And then also, what does this mean for the global environmental impact? Because some impact it, it has. So this is a list of priorities that can be established. Uh, the cleaner production uh, project, it has a number of different phases where you would like to go to uh, take them one by one. And first, of course, that is that you need to identify, is there a problem? Is there a challenge that we need to address? So issue raised. And then the management decision. And here it is so that uh, we can see from experience, I think uh, in many uh, Western countries, I'm sure you have similar in uh, also in um, Uzbekistan, that if we don't get the decision makers involved and we don't get them to uh, think that this is important, nothing will really happen. It's like trying to really swim upstream in a rapid river. Uh, third here is cleaner production group assigned. You need to address and give some uh, people, I mean, uh, the, uh, what do you say, mandate to work on these issues and give them resources. And here it is also very, very important to see this. In Sweden, we have so many examples where we have ambitions to improve society. And so we have a meeting and we give away and say, you take care of this, you take care of this but there is no time or no money uh, allocated and nothing happens. So if you have uh, something that you have been deciding, be sure that you also provide the necessary resources that of course have to be subject to negotiation. Then one of the key aspects of, of everything, and that comes to me from my education uh, in chemical engineer. I am a chemical engineer from the beginning. And that is natural science-based mass and energy balances. That is one of the key aspects of everything that it has to do with the physical reality around us. Because a balance is a balance. Uh, so that means that if there are some numbers missing, when we know that the balance should go together, we can also always fit it. And we can also always assume if we don't have enough numbers, how does the puzzle go together? because no physical substances or in chemistry, it disappears. It does, just can rearrange and become less or more dangerous for ourselves. So mass and energy balance is a key aspect of cleaner production. Improvement alternative selected. There will always be a number of different options that you can take. Some are more, what do you say, deep going. They are more costly and so on. Others are that you can do immediately. And it's a very good thing to think about and try when you set up uh, uh, the alternatives to say, what can I do with the least investments? That is typically so the least uh, lowest hanging fruits. And then to have feasibility um, and feasibility, it has both to do with social aspects. Do I have enemies, people that are thinking about other things would have other priorities. It can be um, the feasibility with respect to resources, knowledge and uh, money and other uh, such things. So this is a screening process. And then at the end, so to select the preferred alternative or alternatives, if there are a, a couple of them that uh, we combine. The project implementation, of course, and then again, always we have then project evaluation. It is very interesting uh, in one way, because um, I always want to see the relative aspects of um, what you plan and what happens. We can say that in one way, the greatest, um, so to say, uh, environmental project that we have had now in uh, 20 years, that is our environmental objectives goals in Sweden. In 1998, I think it was, we set up 16 uh, different environmental goals in Sweden that should be reached by 2020. Do you know how many were reached in 2020? After 20 years, we reached one out of 16. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is an extremely strong signal that we actually did not know at all. 
what actually the, the challenge is to reach these goals. The only goal that was met is that we could combat uh, the ozone uh, degradation. That was decided in the late 1980s, and this is, this is now to the, taken out of the issue. And that is actually not a Swedish, uh, so to say, environmental goal. It is a global environmental goal. All the rest, uh, we have failed. And this also, to me, put a perspective. If we, with all our resources in comparison to most other countries, if we cannot meet our goals, how is it then in the rest of the world? That's another part of my, my strong conviction that now we are all sitting in the same boat, so to say, whether we are Swedes or we are Uzbeks or we are Americans. We have a joint challenge and this challenge is so big, so most people uh, don't understand it at all. And it's uh, the, the challenge is actually we don't have enough ecological space anymore. We are have been uh, growing too fast and too much the human society. And then if, the, if we go to practice, uh, one of these things is that how do we do so that we can analyze and monitor things? That is normally a very, what do you say, painstaking procedure because you need really to sit down and think and match what you see you want to do and how long time it takes, what resources you have and so on, and then evaluate and then go back and, and decide. Uh, and if you don't integrate the whole thing with uh, planning, with evaluation and with uh, implementation of different measures and then evaluate it, then very little will uh, be gained. So very, uh, two very important initial, uh, what should you say, consideration. That is that if you have very primitive processes, so they are far from what we now know that continuous processes, they are normally much more, uh, what do you say, much easier to uh, monitor, supervise, and also much more uh, or easier to optimize. So then it might be interesting in a cleaner production perspective to totally reconsider and see we will, uh, rebuild it into a continuous uh, process. And then the second, if we have rather advanced processes, closed and or continuous, then it can be based on the establishment of mass and energy balances over in the first part, uh, phase, the entire process. So we know what is coming into the area where we have the industrial activity and what is going out in the form of products about uh, emissions to air, emissions to water, and to waste production. Uh, if you look at some basic approaches to cleaner uh, production, and this is then in order of complexity, more or less, time and investment. Uh, how cumbersome, so to say, is it for the entire organization to come uh, to these things that uh, I would like to change? And the first, uh, good housekeeping. And those are actions without, I would say, perhaps I should say major investments. That's to change habits. That's to change, uh, what do you say, uh, procedures. That's to change, uh, what do you say, observations. Very first thing is that what you can do just with your eyes and with your nose and what you smell and so on. So I would put that first. And then second, improved process monitoring and control. And why is this? This is because when I monitor, then I learn what is going on. And in most processes, I will never know everything that is going on, and especially not in real time. However, we can always put some uh, things, I mean, into uh, monitoring in real time today in industrial process. I mean, water flows, for example. We could have oxygen concentrations. We could have other types of, of these monitoring equipment where we can have a continuous signal. We can put it into the computer. We can transform it into a screen where we can 
all the time go and see how it uh, looks like. Actually not in a um, wastewater treatment plant, but in a fish aquaculture plant. I have been part of that uh, to install this uh, process monitoring equipment. And the real, uh, what you say, sensation about this was that this plant uh, outside Stockholm, it had a number of cameras, very cheap cameras. You buy them for less than $100 each and you install them, you connect them to a computer. Then my colleague who is in charge of this uh, fish uh, culture plant, he went to Switzerland to talk to another plant manager that was uh, uh, um, working with perch. And in the Swedish plant, it was pipe perch. And when my colleague said, oh, I need to check my plant. And then he put his uh, iPad and he could see the fish swimming around. He could change to see that the flow meters, that they, the flows were okay. He could see at the oxygen meter and he could see at the carbon dissolved carbon dioxide, real time was okay. And then I said, now we can have the meeting because my fish are okay. He was sitting in uh, Switzerland and the fish were alone in the plant outside Stockholm. This, I mean, is also for uh, cleaner production the way forward. When we get cheap and reliable real-time monitoring and we can put them into computers, we will do a lot more and a lot better. A third uh, approach here is input substitution. How can we change the raw materials to uh, less polluting or toxic uh, raw materials into our uh, activities? In situ recycling, that we, uh, for example, for water and chemicals, and in situ, that's on site. Is it so, for example, that I can uh, take a cooling water and I can reuse it somewhere else in the process instead of having two separate, uh, what say, supplies of water to two different processes? Uh, next is technology. So technological optimization, and that is a process modification. It can be uh, some type of separation equipment. For example, it can be uh, a better screen. For example, if you have a municipal wastewater, before you, have, for example, in the first step in a municipal wastewater treatment plant, you had only a typical um, bar screen where perhaps you had uh, 15 to 20 meet, uh, millimeters uh, width between the bars. And this means that you could collect branches and toilet paper and these things and put it aside. Now you have continuous cleaning screens and they can have a width only of let's say half to one millimeter. And that means that uh, especially if you add uh, some type of coagulating chemical to it, you may reduce uh, or improve the separation of this solid material to uh, two, three times higher than before. So that is, uh, again, that you can take one step and you can separate part of it and then treat it uh, in a more efficient way somewhere else in this treatment plant or in the factory. Redesign of product, byproducts and uh, or packaging. So here we have a whole system. So uh, it both include the product. For example, if we again go back to a fish. So if we, I cultivate the fish in the fish cultivation plant, then about 40, what I eat primarily the filet, and then 50, if, uh, five to 60%, it is byproducts. And of this, so you can make other types of products badly so that you waste less and less. And at the end, you have to, to, to treat a much, much smaller amount what is transformed from um, what is a, uh, that it is waste instead of using it as a rest product. And then a, a boundary condition, you could say to cleaner production, that is offsite recycling. And that, for example, we have the recycling of aluminum or paper fibers. Here it is very interesting that if you see the European paper cycle, it is very interesting in that way that you can see that you have a, <coughs> excuse me, a 
two-wheel uh, process in Europe, where Sweden and Finland, we are the main providers of raw uh, prime fiber, wood fiber. And then we produce both pulp and paper. And this goes and is exported mainly to Europe. And then down in Europe, you have uh, recycling, paper recycling factories that are taking in then uh, mostly recycled fibers, about two thirds. Uh, recycled fiber, then a little bit of a fresh fiber. And in this way, an individual fiber now is not used only once, it is used up to seven times before it leaves the system as a, into an incinerator or something like that. And the problem here is that with every increasing recycling of paper fibers, so the paper quality is decreasing. So the least, uh, what do you say, uh, valuable part that is toilet or household paper or tissue. So that is an off-site recycling. So these are examples, but only fantasy can set the limits to uh, what one can do. Then mass and energy balance is, I mentioned before, a key aspect of cleaner production. And the first step here, that is to make balances for the entire process, so I know that. And here we have a very strong analogy to, uh, uh, to the economy, because the economy over the whole world today, that is only so that I calculate my costs for the raw materials, I calculate my running costs, and then I calculate my income from selling the products. But I don't calculate what I emit to the air, what I emit to the water, and what I emit as waste only the transport of waste or to, to have someone to pay for someone taking care of. And this means that in the whole economic system in the world and for uh, factories that are producing things, economy has not yet adopted to internalize the externalities of emissions. And it's very interesting to see that this is not a very big thing of the whole economy. Typically, if one make, uh, what do you say, careful calculation, so to internalize these emissions and waste that are not properly handled, it is only between one to 5%, sometimes up to 10% of the total balance. But if you do this day after day, year after year, we know that this will lead them to the, the wrong way. So here we can say that uh, my greatest criticism to the whole development today, that is directed to the way we calculate economic balances for activities. Because we have not yet adopted to internalize uh, different types of emissions and put a price on them. And this is when society needs to negotiate with a business, uh, what do you say, manager in order to find out the proper way to tax physical resources that are being lost, emissions to air, water and to land. The second step here, balances for the most important sub-processes. So I can see that in the future, if we're looking here, the balances here, they should of course be forward the, to the authorities and that should be part of the legalization process for the production permit and the emission permits and so on. And then the emissions that people cannot treat, they should be taxed. And this has to come. And the sooner, the better. And then negotiations, both at the local, the national and international level, will have to fix these prices. We have this in these different types of uh, emission, uh, what do you say, permits, and uh, to trade them uh, between countries. And this has come from the United States, but it is not adopted so that one can say that it really works because they are decided the prices of these and they are still far too low to re uh, result in the changes necessary. Uh, then the, we see the fundamental approach here. So we can say that these are the things we need to monitor. The raw materials and others. And then what comes in, energy, air, water, and what goes out, products of course. And then solid waste, atmospheric emissions and liquid emissions. And then it, are, it is these three at the, the bottom here. 
the internalization that is necessary if this is the company that is to, that society needs to to put prices on these things so again we can say that we talked here in the break that in order to reduce water use uh, it is important to have a price on uh, water to have a price on solid waste at emissions and liquid emissions and they need to be set at the level so that it prov um, environment or the ecological ecosystems to be destroyed and then the next step here that is that we go to uh, the whole system and we separate it into subsystems and here, for example, I can decide that when I had my big uh, entire system, I'm looking at other, and then perhaps I can see where can I gain the most in uh, emission reduction to the least effort and the least costs. And then if we look at a certain project for um, uh, Make, to make mass and energy balances. Then aim of it, system boundaries. Always, we have to be very careful about system boundaries. One of these things that has to do with, with um, ecology that the um, uh, uh, very famous American scientist, uh, Herman Daly, when he in the 1990s saw a picture of economy and uh, an illustration in a publication from the World Bank. So he said, but it is like you, you don't see, that you have, don't have any system boundary. And he put a rectangle around the economic system that where you extract the resources and where the waste are being discharged. He could not get that it is absolutely a fundamental aspect of reality because it cross uh, cross too much of the economic thinking. That was now 20 years ago, but, but still it shows how these very big international institutions, they actually don't see the reality where we live in. And it's really tragic, I think, in many ways that this is still the case today. So the sooner we adopt these things that we see, that, that we are taking our resources from our uh, uh, surroundings, from the ecosystems and we are leaving the waste to them. That needs to be included. Materials considered, you always will have to say um, uh, big in, in, in the amount of analysis that you can make and the, the number of considerations you can uh, take. Processes again, so this is actually to take different types of decisions in uh, the project. And then at the end, so we are also coming to the conclusions from results. So again, one can say that there is a, an economic discussion about this so-called Deming uh, uh, cycle. It's a management cycle. Plan, do, act, check. So always doing this to a continuous improvement. Then here is something that you can uh, check yourself. It sh the picture's main message is to show that in a certain factory where you have a concrete project, you will have to monitor in very many different places with a project. So there is a very, what do you say, uh, a special uh, type of uh, needs to, to decide how much resources do I have in a certain moment to make an improvement. And all the time it is so that it is better to really achieve a small improvement with a, a restricted goal than to try to change everything at once because it is a journey and not a specific change. Then here, I would like to show a, couple, a few examples. This is from something that I found on the internet and it shows a number of Portuguese cleaner production uh, uh, what is a projects and the results they present that is for uh, different types of uh, uh, changes according to what I told before good housekeeping and then source reduction process modification material substitution in situ recycling off-site recycling product modification and we can see here that every project is different 
And here is the amount of, of improvement achieved by different means. And then it is very interesting to see that the most important one that is actually good housekeeping. So good housekeeping can do a lot. And I would really say that there is something I would like to see in Uzbekistan tomorrow. That is that people start to fix all uh, what I say, water leakages, all these things where unnecessary losses of water occur. I think this can be done at a minimal effort and uh, what is it cost compared to, uh, I mean, the improvements that you can achieve. Another thing from this is to see here the payback time. This is not calculated with interest, but it is very close to the situation today since international uh, what do you say, uh, interest rates are very low. They are, I mean, zero in, in the state level and for uh, companies and so on, they are between one and two percent. But we can see here that all these projects, they range from only a couple of months up to eight years in payback time. What was the investment and what, how much did I save uh, them per, per, per month and so on. So, I mean, it is very, very feasible. One can say that uh, both for the environment and for uh, the economy, this cleaner production approach is very, very viable. And if these changes would occur that I am uh, propagating for, that we need to have uh, more uh, stringent taxes and follow-ups of emissions, this will be even more, uh, what is say, uh, feasible economically. So this is really a good economy from a much more basic uh, approach level than, than what we have today in uh, different societies. Then I would like to give this last encouraging uh, picture. This is a battery recycling factor in Bolivia, where I had a project in 2004 for the Brazil, uh, Bolivian industry. And this shows actually how a man with a big ax he is cleaving the batteries so that the acid is draining out to the floor and then he can, he can uh, go to another furnace where the lead is recycled. This is of course not the way it should be and we have come in many ways much further than this. But this is anyhow, this was a start for them there at this time. So with this, I would like to thank you for uh, your attention and um, let's uh, finish. I, I don't know if we have time, if there is any or a couple of questions, Lars, you can decide.